Um, all right, so we're here today to talk about Neurozac, and I had a really funny joke about Chad GPT, what Chad GPT thinks about it, but we uh, did not want to add to the AV mix. I was showing slides, but suffice to say is that I had to look it up, and I had a number of kind of thoughts on like Neurozac. This sounds very science fiction, very William Gibson, um, and um, I guess that's the age we live in now, isn't it? Uh, my first question is to uh, Esther Dyson, right here. Um, what do you think about neurotech as an overall topic? Well, I agree. I don't know what it is. So, what I want to talk about is kind of AI and neuroscience, a little bit of psychology mixed in, and the whole notion of symbols. And AI keeps changing. It's what we know how to do. It started out as like if, then, blah, blah, blah. And then they were expert systems which they changed to assistance because the experts didn't want to be replaced. Uh, and then now we're doing a lot with language, but what really gets more interesting is sort of understanding the structure and meaning of things as opposed to chat GPT-3 is really more a repeater very effectively. But it, it comes up with new random things like delusions and hallucinations, but it doesn't come up with new models. So it looks like it's thinking, but it's not thinking. It's yeah, like people. I mean, well, you know, this is true. Yeah, and so that's why it's so hard. I mean, the real issue is what we want when we teach people, we want to teach them how to think and to come up with new stuff. And ChatGPT3 can perfectly well represent the old stuff. So it, I mean, long term, I think this is going to create more demand for really good teachers even as it creates less demand for copywriters and, and people who write politicians' resumes. Thank you. I got one. <laughs> <laughs> um, See, so I'm not sure if you can do that. It probably would not. Um, but so this crosses a lot of boundaries, right? You've already mentioned um, uh, AI, neuroscience, and, and there is some kind of feedback, for lack of a better term, feedback loop between AI and, and and neuroscience, but like what what are your thoughts about kind of we cross this crosses a lot of boundaries, and it's hard to categorize this as one thing. Would you would you lump this in kind of like the same category as NLP and AI? Well, yes, I mean, but NLP is a specific subset of AI. Sure. AI is the very very broad term, and then there's also there's tech for neurodiversity in, in the sense of lots of different people have lots of different ways of interacting with the world. We sort of assume that there's just one or two ways and now we can have tech that is broader. You know, everything in from people who are short-sighted or long-sighted people who hear too much you can muffle things, people who don't hear enough you can exaggerate them. And so you can, you can just personalize tech a lot more to make things accessible to people in whatever way they want to interact with the world. Interesting. So the, the question I have for you then is how real is this feeling? It's, it's all over the place and it's very real and very early. And you know, again, as we begin to understand how to do certain things, they will kind of peel off and be their own little suspect. Uh, just like extra existing Paper clip wizards or whatever. Oh, Clippy. Yes. Like we are in the house of Clippy. So now it's a real sign in this world because we have a lawyer on stage. You know that we don't think it's very interesting though. We've neurotech as a concept, right? It's a term for a bubble and there's an AI piece, there's an ethical piece, there's as you move into hardware, is it a device that interacts with the neurological system? Is it AI that helps improve the human body? Is it AI that helps create a product that helps the human. There's a lot of different areas. Some of it is slightly older and maybe at the beginning of it, some of the AI piece gets newer and newer. And so I think when we talk neurotech, it's very much an undefined bubble term for a whole group of different technologies that create an amalgam together that are in interaction with humans. So not a joke, but do you mean a bubble that includes things or a bubble that bursts? 
Well, I think it, it could grow to be <laughs> called that list, but right for right now, I think it's a growing and inclusive one, right? It's on the exponential bubble. Right. Yeah. And then it eventually it becomes the other type of bubble. Um, eventually. But so so quick question, because uh, you're the, the only lawyer here on the side. Don't know if you're a lawyer. Don't look at the back of the room. There are no other lawyers. No other lawyers here. No lawyers. This is not a lawyer. Really. Somebody's raising this. No, I found a whole entourage. What do regulators think of this? Like, what do they do? They kind of throw up their hands, or they they kind of dust off the lawyers. Regulators have a lot of thoughts on this, and so now we're getting together. What what are the areas of law you want to talk about? You want to talk about corporate law and the way companies are governed. We can talk about patent law and the way to protect these inventions. You talk about FDA and the way we regulate and approve certain devices, and each one is its own very interesting space, right? You talk about the use of AI for drug design or interactions to find new biological targets. Well, FDA doesn't necessarily have a lot of play there, but corporate structure matters there, and patent law has a lot to say about that. Move into something like a deep brain stimulator versus one of the transcranial stimulators, now you get into regulatory and how much is required to get out of the market, right? It's very different to say, all right, take a patch, put it on your arm, take a patch, put it on your brain, cut your brain open and stick something pretty deep into the cerebellum. Yeah, I would imagine that the, the FDA would have more than one thing to say about They have it. a couple of cutting <laughs> people's brains yeah. open. Just stuff. a few. Yeah. Um, so, so my thought when I first heard Neurotech, I was like, yeah, I want to be like Trinity kids out there that's like, yeah. um, but like where she's like, I want to learn how to fly a helicopter, right? And they load in the thing and suddenly she learns how to fly a helicopter and the same thing comes to the piano and stuff like that. Um, but this is more than that, right? This isn't just about enhancing kind of this. This could be therapeutic. Yeah, and I think the therapeutics could have started a long time ago. I mean, think of Parkinson's disease and, and some of the other uses for stimulators. I mean, that technology was actually invented in the 70s. Now, it wasn't of a usable version. And now you're getting in finally to the place where you have processors and algorithms that work at a level that allow you to harness these stimulators in a, a very important way. I mean, there are vagal nerve stimulators. Most people, if you get to advanced Parkinson's, have the option to look at trials or devices that are either transcranial or implanted stimulators to help with neurological function. And it's, it's a very, it's a very much evolving space. That hits home because my father in law actually has Parkinson's. And I see you raise your hand. Yeah, I mean, just, just to put things in perspective, lobotomy was also a form of neurotech. It was widely considered to be a mistake ultimately. And there is a lot of psychoactive drugs that have huge and horrible side effects. So, you know, it's, it's not like this stuff's all new. No. Well, and it comes back around, not to jump on you, but the newest space that we're seeing is non hallucinogenic psychedelics. From clinics in New York that offer ketamine based treatments to people trying to now repurpose drugs like LSD and other uh, that we used to think that were done in the 50s. Can you make a version that has the therapeutic qualities but not hallucinogenic? Yeah, and it turns out most of those work much better with proper human. Guys, if you like. Yeah, regulatory guidance. Or no, no, people. human guidance. Oh, people. yes, yes. Interesting. So, I uh, knew you have something to say. Um, if our moderator yeah, can speak up a little bit. Moderator will speak up. Every, everybody. Everybody okay. speak up. Got it. Uh, sorry about that for folks in the field. Sure. Um, so, one of the things that you always see ads for on TV uh, is for depression, right? And I understand that you have specialized, your company specializes in depression, but uh, for women, is that, is that correct? Yeah, it is. Um, but first of all, I would like to add about the ear attack yeah. and the law regulations, because I'm a tech person, I'm up in the tech background, and I love to say that nature is that is coding way before it's become mainstream. And now, finally, we have a chance to take a look at the most fascinating and the most complex computer in the world, our brain. So basically, it gives us an opportunity to learn from the brain, so how it's coded, how it works, and at the same time, learn about the brain. So how can we study better? How can we treat each other? How can we understand our behavior, our patterns? So behind the near attack, I would like to combine all these definitions together. So it's about how we apply brain in our technology and how we apply technology to understand the brain. So there's a feedback over here. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. So if you look, for example, at AI and machine learning algorithms, there's a lot of things which actually they take it from the way how our neurons connected and how they work. So we kind of learn from the brain and a little bit of uh, stealing from them. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, um, and that's why... The on nature has expired, right? Just checking. Yes, yeah, I'm afraid so, yeah. <laughs> so another thing that's fascinating about the brain is that every brain of every human creature is unique. So here we're coming to the wiggle part, I guess. <laughs> Always comes back to the wire. <laughs> yeah, so it means if we will decode the brain eventually, and I hope we will, it means that we will we'll know too much things about every person. And it will be very related to some individual information that we would like to hide and to protect. So here, even when I'm doing my startup and we look at the brain to understand the treatment response, I basically know something about you that you maybe don't want us to know about you. So and I think this ethical question will a little hold up the development of this field. But at the same time, it's quite interesting. How are we going to work with that? How are we going to protect it? If we're already, even from the beginning, our parents can understand too many things now that we have like a lot of big companies who look at our like behavior in the internet. They so, know somebody is pregnant before anyone else does. Exactly, exactly. And now you're looking into the place where actually all this information are like born, <laughs> waiting for people who can understand with their consciousness. Like this is a little bit terrifying. So um, and back to the depression. <laughs> yes, I do study female depression for uh, a few reasons. Uh, first of all. I was fascinated and at the same time quite upset about how women are understudied overall, and especially in the mental health space, because like, oh, they're just human, they're just emotional, that's it. So most of the drugs uh, for mental health were developed on women, men, uh, faster than men, and the thing is that we have no idea about what actually can help them. And at the same time, uh, there is like a scientific point of this, because uh, we probably know that depression still is not diagnosed by a biological element. It's just a questionnaire, which means that if you have some symptoms like loss of appetite or loss of sleep, um, and the other half present the same symptoms, we probably may have different results of visuals to present. And um, this is the complex thing about the, like depression or other mental disorders. We don't know how to treat them because we don't know how what actual disorder people have. Right. We just know some subjective reports and statements. So, and my goal was to at least give one step toward identifying what depression is and how it could be treated was to lower down the sutrogenesis in my as much as possible. So basically, at least we take just one sex, women. Um, I'm mostly working with postpartum depression or perimenopausal depression, so I'm also taking like specific age period, and I'm also taking like specific specific events that happen in their lives, like pregnancy. So that way I can at least give myself and my models and my system a chance to identify like what is actually depression and how it can be responded in those specific cases. Interesting. So uh, when you say responded, is it a met is it a medicine, therapeutic, or yeah. some combination? So if we we'll look at the clinical files, we will see that the failure rate in psychiatry is worse than in any other field, 99 percent. Wow. So for PPD only, there was for the last 10 years over 100 clinical files of the Zulrasa has been approved and went to the market next to the stage. Um, and this is quite interesting and fascinating. Why so? So. The one thing is to identify the mental disorder, right? But how that will help? Okay, you will have mental disorder, and, and why? You actually would like to know how to help this person, right? And which means you would like to know what medication is actually works for this particular person. And this is exactly what we're trying to do. Trying to so personalized medicine. You have a thought? Yeah. I mean, just you, you said we can define depression. And something like depression is actually an interaction between some scientific thing and a unique individual. Like you said, people are incredibly complex. And a lot of mental disease is reactions to toxic circumstances, whether it's 
what happens to you after you get a baby, or you know, if you're a homeless person, you may start out with some mental challenges, and they get much worse. You know, being homeless is not a place to cure your depression. So it's it's much more an interaction between a person and something that interacts with that person. Well, I think part of the problem is wrong is that you know, depression, a lot of mental health issues. It's not like I used to be an EMT way, way back in the day, right? Somebody had a broken arm. You know, he, it's pretty obvious, right? There's a pretty fairly objective way to figure out if somebody has broken an arm or sprained sprain their arm, right? Well, with depression, a lot of, or, or any mental uh, health condition, is um, rely on self reporting. Exactly. Only Sounds about. dangerous. It is. That is quite dangerous. Well, and you hit on, I think, one of the biggest challenges of the space, right? Take when you talk about the heterogeneity of a patient population, uh -huh. if you start with cancer, people say, okay, well, there's a genetic marker there. So you can define the class of people for which you're gonna provide a drug to treat, right? How many breast cancer drugs exist? You hear all the time. It's HER2 positive or triple negative. Each of those refers to a shape of a protein somewhere. So you can define for your clinical trial a very specific set of people for which you're gonna give the drugs to determine failure or not. I think exactly to your point, a questionnaire does not define biological sequelae. It may be an indication, but do you know if you have five groups of people for depression or not? And you probably now hit on. So why have clinical trials for drugs failed? If you don't know what the target is for the disease, how do you treat it? And even in Sage's drug, which has come out, I think when you look at the launches over the last year of all drugs in total, it's maybe been one of the most underperformers. Because for some people it works. For other people, it absolutely doesn't work. We call them depressed, but there isn't. I mean, what's one of the biggest classes of pain? Chronic pain with no, no reason. And we diagnose that by saying, well, we've looked at you and we don't see anything physically wrong, and you have nothing in your brain that is abnormal for a brain scan, but you're reporting that you have pain. So you just fall into this bucket of chronic pain. And then we say, well, we're going to treat chronic pain. What does that mean? There's no way those millions of people all have the same biological origins for that pain. I would imagine depression and sleep disorders, what you're talking about, is why you started with postpartum, because at least maybe there's a group of people that have a commonality in biology, potentially. Well, yeah, they're still heterogeneous as postpartum depression. But yeah, at least I'm kind of out of the 20, for example, groups taking just a few of them, like three, and have a chance to. So at least you might have a chance to see a pattern. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. No, I mean, that makes sense, because I mean, uh, you know, as a software engineer, I tend to look at the world that way, right? So we're going to look at the world like a lawyer. Um, you know, the mental health is both the hardware and a software problem. Or, either or, I mean, like, and how do you narrow that down? The hardware, you probably, with really good MRIs and functional MRIs, you can probably get a good look at that, or I suppose that technology. It's hopeful. I mean, right, we have, we do brain imaging, we do all sorts of work. I mean, we're working with a company in New York that's looking at a new way using AI to reinterpret ECG signals, interesting, and EEG signals. Anyway, yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll it's like, quote, what is normal? Is normal good? Or is normal just common? And abnormal is simply a different version. Yeah. Like, it seems like our language is not up for the task. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, just like normal. No, it's, it's our model of the world. Interesting. Yeah, maybe. I mean, again, as, as human beings evolved, things that were abnormal Right. Gave them a competitive advantage and said they became us. We were we were the outliers for you know distant past generations. Of people. And no, maybe we point. succeeded because we were mean and nasty, not because we were necessarily better. Which is a truly scary thought. Um, do we have online? Options? Do we have any online questions? Oh, oh, online. Don't we have? Oh, sorry, don't we have Atlas for uh, virtual? We don't we have panelists right now. Oh, we, we lost our panelists. One's, right, in Australia. Somebody one's in Australia, and one's in Europe, and the time is probably okay. uh, difficult. Um, that's, well, that time zones affect one's behavior as well. This is true. This is true. Um, there's a commercial, I love a series of commercials uh, about you're not you when you're angry. And the joke has to be something. Snickers, that's right. That's good thing we want. Um, figures the IP lawyer would know exactly the brand. Bravo. Bravo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So this is a new and emerging field, right? Um, and there's a, a lot of it. What do you think the business opportunity? You're an investor. Like, what? What? What's the business opportunity? Is it real? Is it? Well, the business opportunity is the same as in any new field. It's is my mic working okay? 
it's, yes. it's finding things that are useful and then actually looking for good management. Right? Right. You know, don't get too sucked in by the amazing technology. But what I see is sort of when you go to AI and generative AI and care about the new stuff, yeah, the, the question is always, are we going to replace the people? Or are we going to put everybody out of work? And as I said sort of at the beginning, I think this really creates an opportunity for people to do what people are best at and to, you know, we, we replace sort of physical labor, and now we can replace mental labor as opposed to human creativity and human love. I mean, we talk about training AIs and all this stuff, and we kind of neglect. We should be training our babies. Huh. And because if you look at what's going on in this country, there's a huge need for better child care. And broadly, there's a need for better teachers. There's a need for human connection. There's a need for the guides who take you on your psychedelic trip. And right. so, you know. Two or three hundred years ago, people used to see themselves as, well, sometimes I work like a horse and sometimes I work like a dog. And then they started feeling, well, I work like a machine. And now they often, they do this rope, rope repetitive mental labor and they work like a computer. And so the highest form of labor is working like a human being that has emotions and sensibility and creativity and so if we do it right we will help people fulfill the most human part of their nature if we do it wrong we'll make them feel useless and we'll find another metaphor for the function yeah well they will i mean the opposite of taking drugs is not not taking drugs the opposite right. of taking drugs is feeling needed and useful and interacting with other people and being part of society and that's the real challenge. Interesting. I, I think that um, you brought up some very interesting points. You know, um, you know, the first being is that everyone's all wrapped around the axle because you know, all of this the AI is going to take jobs away. And historically, the good news is that that's not worked out. You know, automation in textile uh, factories in the 1800s did not lead to mass unemployment and starvation. Just fast fashion. Just fast fashion. Um, so I, 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 I think I, I think that pattern will continue. And it's just like you said, we'll be doing different types of work. You know, about 100 years ago, most people will probably work in the land, working like a dog, working like a horse, but my dogs don't work at all. Um, but, um, you know, and then, you know, we all moved to the cities and we've got jobs in factories. Now we don't do that so much. Now we became what Microsoft is called knowledge work. Uh, you know, uh, and, and you know what's beyond knowledge. I don't think anyone's really thought that through. Emotional worker. Emotional worker. Or, or again, creative worker. Creative worker. Yeah, that's interesting. You look like you have something to say. No, I think it's just fascinating when we talk about where are the opportunities in the economy. I mean, the Journal just reported today that there's a group in Canada, Deep Market, that just spun off an AI division as an investment fund looking to invest in natural language and other associated AI-based technologies. The economic opportunity is real. I think it has started in how do we interpret big data to get a real outcome? It's purely in the medical space, it started with clinical trials, right? You get a failed clinical trial. Is there a signal within that group that actually responded? That became a real market opportunity, and that started a while ago. The application of AI and more intelligent algorithms to better interpret the volume of data we created in the world is, I think, we're living in that time right now. I mean, a, a very simple way it was explained to me once is for the first problem was how do you unlock the sample, right? You can't get the information if you don't do that. Then it was, well, how do you generate data from the sample? So we sort of conquered that in a lot of ways in many areas of medicine. But we have, in fact, created our own big challenge for ourselves, which is we have so much data, it's right. how do you get an actual signal from that data. So great, we produce data. What's meaningful data and actionable data and what's noise and what's and what's real for that? That's happening today. Then I think you start looking at, okay, where does this then lead? And then maybe you get closer to some of these more ethical lines that will be defined maybe over the next decade or so. But for now, I think it's very much 
aligned with using the tools we have to be able to find useful discoveries from them or make sense of the noise. Right, and I think that's a good point because, you know, um, once upon a time I was talking to somebody who was so proud that they have six terabyte games. Let me put that again. Now, this individual was telling me this in 2016 when that really wasn't that big of a deal anymore. Um, but in 2005, when the project started, yes, that was, you know, this is from the engineer's point of view, like being able to store, gather, and collect data yeah. and not have it like implode on itself at yeah. that scale was was the challenge. Yeah. Now the challenge is how do you, well, okay, well, we've solved that problem. You can just uh, plug in a plug for Azure, right? You can just turn on your Azure spend uh, and they manage all the details for you. Um, but now it's kind of like, well, why are we, and now we're getting to that point where we can do it, why should we do it? And a lot of that is looking for this signal inside the noise. Well, and talking about how it is, and all I mentioned because I have to agree, this book I'm trying to There's a book called The Professor and the Man, and it's the story of the creation of the Oxford Dictionary. How interesting. It took not only a million people, but almost 50 to 70 years to put together the first 20 volumes. Now you just Google a word, right. and it's defined. So to think in less than 100 years, we moved from what was what took that amount of human power and that timeline to something that is at your fingertips. And that's sort of what we're talking about is the evolution that's occurring. It's also a really good one. Interesting. Five yeah. chapters. Yes. Uh, How are we doing on time? No, we're great. We okay. lost time. There looks like there's two chats and three QAs. I don't know whether Jeff or Jim can read them out loud. Uh, I'm not. We're trying to access them. <laughs> okay. well, well, they can figure it out. Um, <laughs> you sound like you're a data scientist. Is that correct? <laughs> Well, I manage the group of data scientists. You manage, okay. Yes, and I have a master's in applied mathematics, but I'm very far from the more okay. data science. But you know the hard part of data science. Oh, uh, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'd like to add one more thing to investment for an economic opportunity. Uh, really something, not maybe that positive. Uh, there is a lot of hype right now like, around the New York tax, but there is one thing I really would like people would understand. It will take a while. Like where we would like to get, we need a lot of time and a very detailed work to be sure that what we actually do it was great. We do it correct. And uh, I also want to I'll, I'll let you speak next, but you know, you mentioned lobotomies at one point were considered, yeah, you know, a viable treatment option. Now we look back and horror at that, and I think exactly. uh, that probably keeps you up at night. Uh, am I going to be the next? That's going to sound bad. Am I going to be the next person who invented the body? Like, exactly, know, exactly. I mean, and I think about it every day. Like, right. if something that I mean, I think ethical today will be ethical in 10 years. Right. All people will see that or they will judge me for that and be like, oh my God, what you've done. People will forget that ethics is a moving target. Exactly. And the same will be uh, with this field. And another thing, we are right now talking about the economical applications, but I prefer to talk about the near tech as top tech. Which means you're working more about the technology, and then the way how you can apply it arises from like what you invent. So right. you're thinking about not in the beginning like you do most other type of businesses, where you like analyze the market, looking for the like uh, is there any demand in it, and you just like then after that trying to um, chase some kind of economic opportunities. This is more about a lot of data scientists, like near scientists, combining together. Um, doing their research, finding some amazing technology, and then <coughs> you see a lot of the potential how can you apply it in this completely different field of industry. So back to economic, economic opportunity here. You have a startup in this space, don't you? At least um, one. I've got a bunch, but what a bunch. I, <laughs> I sort of wanted to take the data science statistics on try to explain what we're so GPT-3 and generative AI and a lot of the sort of the genetic stuff is you know, in genetics or in, in oncology you're looking for a particular mutation or something. But the what gets more interesting is creating models. So it's kind of the difference between, you know, you can train an AI to recognize things, it can recognize people, it can recognize, but it still doesn't necessarily know how a horse is constructed and what it, how it will move or why the water flows out of the glass. It can imitate it perfectly. Right. 
statistically, but it's, it's this ability to build models that gets really interesting. And that's you know that's why GPT three doesn't still doesn't understand stuff. Right. And that's very much a moving target. And you see that in, in a lot of this mid generation stuff. Because uh, I see we have a question uh, where if you ask it to a person, it'll sometimes pop a third arm out of its forehead or something like that. Clearly, it doesn't understand human anatomy. Maybe it's a must buy, I don't know what that person. Arms pop out of its forehead. But again, that gets back to the mom. It doesn't. Uh, question. We have a question from Jordan. Uh, and the question is Are AI empowered intelligent agents, in quotes, sophisticated enough that they might support? A person's daily task needs, but also serve as an emotional contact point, and perhaps even a teacher. Question mark. So I will summarize the question uh, from Jordan. Thanks, Jordan, for asking. Uh, the question is: Intelligent bots or agents uh, will they ever? Uh, sounds like meet emotional needs, not just informational needs. Is that a good summary? I see a lot of people nodding. That's good. Yeah. So Jordan had another comment. And he had another so, comment. Social services that help the disabled and elderly are in a crisis state, <coughs> unable to find enough direct care workers to ensure pop proper care. So the follow-up part of that was that social workers and um, direct care are really understaffed right now. Oh, There's a crisis right. with elderly, and if you look at the demographics of the country, it's not going to get worse before it gets better. And can bots kind of fill that hole? Uh, just. Perhaps. Perhaps. What do, you, what do you think? That just ethical, like, fire alarm is going off in my head right now. What do, what do you say? Yeah, I mean, I don't really want, there's there's lots of creepy movies about people falling in love with box. Right. <laughs> and, you know, that, how should I say, it may satisfy their emotional confusions. Right. But it offends me as a human being. I'd rather see them have a very good box that can put them in the tub and wash them. And, right. And then supplement it with a dog that is a real dog rather than a fake human. Right. No, I mean, that makes sense. It's an important distinction. What of intelligent bot that can perform physical tasks that are helpful versus can you actually create one that replicates human emotion and complexity at that level? Well, can it fake it? Yeah. Not replicate it. Yeah. I think that's fair. My experience with any airline website chatbot is no. <laughs> what do you have to say? Um, so it's quite a complex question, and eventually we may be, we will get there. For example, right now a bunch of start, a bunch of startups which are actually working to develop online psychotherapy, which where will start chat will will we'll start with you with some kind of conversation based on example cognitive behavioral therapy, and like people are thinking toward this. Uh, but now let's talk about on the customer side what's actual emotional connection is and it's way more complex just than just perceiving some information in a text. It's about about the mirroring neurons, it's about the oxytocin that they have developed inside. It's about a lot of chemical and biological like events that happen in our bodies, which is why we experience some kind of emotion or attachment. So I don't know how soon we can get there so we will understand not only the how to talk as a psychiatrist or psychologist, but also how to manipulate someone's body in that way that they will respond in the same way as the like real human being. I think it gets back to empathy, right? Like how do you how do you mathematically model empathy? I don't think you can. Uh, although 50 years from now someone will watch this and think how quaint. <laughs> go ahead. What's with you guys about my startups and I was thinking that yeah, you know, tech, but actually I've got a bunch of startups. One in particular is called Supportive with no no E. And it's basically a moderated, somewhat constructed set of messaging interactions of peer to peer support from real people rather than a psychiatrist. Interesting. And obviously they they get some training and there's a lot of oversight, but that's that's more real. I mean it's a very familiar thing, you know, you feel depressed and you go sit on a bus and you tell a stranger your story because you don't want to tell it to people you know. So there's there's a lot of chat therapy out there that is human beings as opposed to 
therapy, which is so, so directed. Okay? So I'm a really lucky, nice white lady. And I've had two primary care physicians over many years. And one was the best friend of my business partner. The next one is the sister of another friend of mine. And, you know, if I run into them in the grocery store, they will recognize me. And that's, that's what's missing in so much of medicine, whether it's physical medicine or emotional you know, psychotherapy stuff. I think this is linked back to what you were talking about earlier, which is the time scale for what we're talking about, the importance of getting it right. If you're going to do it, do it right. I think the examples of some of the ones you were just talking about have shown up in the journal for the wrong ways because <laughs> they're the examples of a marketing team pushing beyond what the tech is because there's, right, this is the danger where when does science and business reach and, and who are the right people to help you, right? There's good investors and there's investors that maybe aren't at the right fit because they see the wrong timeline and the wrong return. And if you push ahead of it, you end up in the paper for the wrong reason, which is you don't do what you think or promise you're doing. You lie from a regulatory perspective because you're driving bottom dollar profits because you're public or not. And it's really saying, who's the right partner that's going to actually stay with you for the long haul and develop it at the right pace because they want to do it right. No one wants to be the next Brenos. Right. Or, or cerebral. Yeah. Or FTX. Yeah. Which then kills an entire industry, right? I mean, the blood testing industry is in the same sense that if we're not careful in what we develop here, the first one out of the box could ruin it for a very long time for others because the market's fickle. So you're saying marketing gets ahead of engineering. So don't focus on that. That's, 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 that's my disclaimer. That's my disclaimer. Yeah, I guess the financial metabolism wipes out the more of the DNA. Oh, I like that. Go ahead and quote her up. That needs to be a laptop sticker. Another question. Another question. Richard Bukowski, have there been any major advances in hardware or neuro, for Neurotech, or is it just reuse old hardware and software based? So the question is from Richard, thanks for asking, is have there been advances in hardware or are we using old hardware with better analytics on that? I mean, the, the things we've seen is, yes, there's been advances in the hardware itself, the materials that make these up. There have been advances in the algorithmics behind them. There have been advances in processing power and actually just power sources generally. So I think there's always pieces that have existed for a while, like at, at base level, an electrode is an electrode. But the material for which it's made, its conductivity, the way it works, the way it receives a processing signal, everything always builds on what came before it. And so I think there's advances across the board that are always happening. Cost of down too. I mean, the news had been yeah. Cost um, structures is way down. You know, somebody just can't believe it. You know, yeah. they put this thing in your forehead. It's about three hundred dollars, and exactly. it can read your brain waves. Now, yeah. what does that data? You know, yeah. Who knows? And whether it's really doing what it says it's doing. Well, yeah. what, what's, what's a commercial product versus what's a medical product? That's the point. That's a consumer product. Right. That is, that, they are not making medical claims, and that's the big difference. And that's where maybe this field gets a very complicated. People like flashy consumer. Flashy consumer is not medical. There is no clinical trial behind someone who's created a consumer product. Not calling them out specifically, but there is a group of regulatory people that will define for you the statements you can make that were considered to be outside of the purview of FDA and the statements that get you in trouble. There's a whole group of people that doesn't make them wrong, but their companies are designed to not get into the regulatory paradigm because it's costly, it's expensive to market, and it may not prove out, but it dramatically, in my view, damages those who are looking to create a medical product because it, it takes what, what was that quote again? The DNA and metabolism. The normal DNA gets overrun by the financial metabolism. Yeah, I can see that because I, you know, if I'm not calling any particular company out, but you'll see this on vitamin uh, ads and whatnot, right? You'll say this has not been, yeah. you know, substantiated. So I can't agree more, especially with the fact that yeah, there is a lot of innovation in hardware, but the question that you can't get from the investor, like. Oh, how are you gonna scale it? How you got into the clinics, into the like different corporations? How you can make it accessible? And this is a tricky part. So that's why at the same time you have to use the existing technology and put some good software on top of this, so you will can get faster to the market. 
And at the same time, keep in mind, like, oh, okay, there's now some new, new technologies may arise in like 10 years, 15 years, and that you should be able to switch later on. So it's quite tricky uh, because like some financial interests are holding back the hardware market, and it's like very complex medical system, very complex insurance system, and all of this stuff that's like going on there. And at the same time, um, like people who invest in something, and at the the people at the start are entrepreneurs who will understand the complexity of the market to try like, okay, my goal is to get somewhere somehow there. It's my goal is to help people finally. Right. So I have to use what I have. I think you brought up a really important point, which is it's actually sometimes not beneficial to be disruptive tech. Right. It's better to be version five, that's big, well better than version four when you're a business. The problem with disruptive tech is who are you disrupting? Right, there's, right, there's economics, there's financial, and when you start getting into the medical space, you, I mean, it's maybe the most complicated space in the world with respect to who are the interested parties. Yeah, it starts to get very, you start walking into some very dangerous waters. Patrons, patrons, yeah. Well, I just wonder, can regulation, can regulatory agencies kind of speak off of you know, these yeah. exchanges? No, I, that's kind of what I thought the answer was. But it's fragmented. Right. Each one is looking out for a particular piece but holistically, it's, it's, it's incredibly complicated. And I, I wouldn't even begin to be the person to tell you I understand it from top to bottom. But I think if someone tells you they understand it from top to bottom, they may not be selling you a whole thing. Right, right, right. What's the thing about selling the purple merch? Right. Um, one of the things I think is interesting, and I think this is very telling, um, you know, we mentioned chat GPT several times, right, kind of a joke and in, in jest and in passing. Dolly 2 came out. Right, image generation. That ruffled some feathers. But Chat GPT really like just ruffled every feather. Is that does that say something about humans, how yes, art is important, how we communicate, but we're trying to rely on text? Well, because again, art is art and there may be a few symbols in there, but it's visual. Text is symbols that so there's a guy David Waltz who's a wonderful AI work, natural language guy said, words are not in themselves carriers of meaning. The point is to share understanding. And so there's there's two heads on either side. And you have so in a sense that one of the hardest phrases in English to understand is, let's have lunch. Right. You know, like, what does that really mean? Are they just springing along? Are they hungry? Uh, do What's they want to they actually have it right now? Yeah. Of yeah. Let's have lunch. Um, and so GPT-3 lacks the models that the words indicate it has in a way that pictures don't really. I mean, pictures can be deceptive because you put somebody's body into someone else's head and so forth and so on. But the, it's, I mean, there are two different forms of meaning. And the meaning, you know, you could look at a woman's face, and that same face to somebody is, oh my god, that's my mother. That's my girlfriend. That's my mistress. Uh, that reminds me of my sibling. Yeah. So the meaning is perceived differently by everybody, but a description in theory should provoke a more similar meaning in different heads. So it's just it's it's much more complicated. It's much richer. And again, those models underlying the language are generally not quote understood. In other words, cannot be manipulated independently by GPT-3. It, it can tell you what most people say about a situation, but it it can't it can't analogize very effectively. Right. Because it's not it's not it's I think one of the things that's confusing people is it's capable of using an abstract concept like language um, and pointing to other things, like you said, uh, although you said that. Um, but it has no understanding of it. It's really just kind of like, for lack of a term, a really amped up version of predictive text on your phone. Like, you know, amped up several words. Yeah, it's energy, very but, amped. And right. Nature, but still fundamentally nothing inside. Right. Fascinating. Another question? Yeah, another question. Oh, we were having so much fun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, you hesitated. I heard that. <laughs> All right. From uh, Inzimal Islam. I recently used ChatGPT and saw how AI can change the way we research, collect, and interpret information. 
if AI does that work for us, then how can we adapt to the changes it brings? Question mark. Don't we have to research any? Don't we have to do research anymore? Question mark. So the summary is that A and ChatGPT can do the research uh, for you. Um, do we have to do research anymore? Uh, that is that opens up so many, so many follow-on questions and ethics. But go ahead. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. And uh, one of my like studies was a while ago when I tried to understand how smartphone uses the fact of cognitive ability. And research itself is quite a complex cognitive process, which involves a lot of things, like writing, reading, listening, like um, comprehension of different parts, and etc. And the thing is, it will not, like AI, I mean, and technology will not substitute the process that's going on inside your brain, but rather push it toward new limits. Which means, for example, a lot of people said that using the smartphones actually very bad for your brain. It's not really that. Because it improves your creativity, because it's providing you a lot of insights, a lot of patterns that you've never seen before, which provides you a lot of like new points from which you can create a new things. Second, it changed completely people's attention. It didn't get uh, worse or better. It just changed. You now can switch between tasks way faster than before. And there's a lot of other things that you just learn how to use your brain for different tasks. So I think it will just challenge the how we think and how we do research rather than substitute the process completely. I think the, the other question comes to my mind is should we rely on chat GPT to do what research for us? Yeah. Right? That sounds like a bad idea. That's why I go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to try a different analogy. So I really came at, I mean, I did very well in school, but I didn't really like it. Um, because I did what chat GPT came as. I got out and collected information and did research and put things together. Um, but you know, fundamentally, I wasn't finding out anything new. I was just repeating what was out there and maybe collecting it more nicely. Then when I became a reporter and also was writing papers for a, a duty group, I mean, suddenly I felt I was creating something new and finding out new stuff and coming to a new conclusion, and that was wonderful. And you know, maybe I'm biased, but to me, that's that's a higher order. Doing research, collecting what's already known is very different from coming to new conclusions. And that's ideally what we want to teach kids to do. I mean, you know, there are some, there's a lot of old things you need to know first, and GPT-3 is very good at collecting them for you. But collecting them and then repeating them is no longer a good way of testing a kid's ability because GPT-3 can do it better. And so you want that more person-to-person -person teaching process where you watch a child learn to think and solve problems. And then again, you want to apply people to doing new stuff. And you know, what, what it's really going to do, like personalized marketing and unfortunately personalized manipulation. I imagine what trolls can do to, uh, to political advertising when it ends up being very well personalized. And they're already pretty well weaponized as it is. So. Yeah, but it's, I mean, I get pitches all the time. I really like your investment profile if you want to invest in this cosmetics company. And as far as I can tell, their notion of my investment pro profile is that I'm female. Right. Because I've never invested in a cosmetics company. So you just get some, somebody's mathematical model for Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, but exactly. And with more, <coughs> more time spent, you can actually do much better personalized research. I recently wrote about this, and it was, uh, I'll give another movie analogy, this one from Aliens. So, uh, spoiler alert, but it's a movie from 1986, so if you haven't seen the ending by now, uh, you know, I can't help you. Um, um, the main character, Ripley, um, she had, uh, at the end, she used that exoskeleton, right? And the exoskeleton was originally built for loading heavy boxes, and then she ended up defeating the alien queen on that, spoiler alert. Um, uh, but but I see that I see chat in a lot of these technologies is kind of like an exosuit because you can do more. You still have to drive it, but I worry that people will start relying on it too much. 
Well, I mean, then we should get rid of cars because people are relying on cars too much. Well, that's true. Yeah, so let's push us to the limit. That's true. That's a good point. I spend every New Yorkers and drive. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't drive until I left. Yeah. So I totally understand. Well, with everything, that's where regulation starts coming in. I mean, yeah. it's unregulated. Usually, is what happens is someone creates or pushes a boundary that, as a collective, we say is too far. So we put regulation in, and people work around it. So it's the feedback loop we talked about. Right. Right. The regulation creates the next workaround, which creates the next path, which creates the next workaround, and it's an endless cycle. That pattern pops up in a lot of places. <laughs> it's almost like human nature. It is almost like human nature. Um, any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Here? Oh, in person. Yeah. Sure. Um, in terms of, in terms sure. of um, I know we also, I know um, you guys have talked about Chat GPT, but I also want to know um, in terms of deep things, in in your in your studies, have you guys like ever learned how or like do research in in your attempt to spot misinformation or to detect anything that you know that can cause um, any type of you know, any type of ruckus in uh, like social media or in like, society. Like, have you guys like used technology to like um, your attempt to like make it spot this information? It's not my space, but I'm aware that it's it's a, there is plenty of protected technology developed by some of the large companies that are social media companies that do that. And it sort of you sort of hit exactly on the prior question, which is. Why was that invented? Because someone figured out how to do a deep fake and we decided that was wrong, which then created a whole new market of people who could create algorithms to spot deep fakes and regulate around it. And so I have not done research on it, it's not my space, but I know it's out there. Many companies have models that work on it. And there's a, there's already a chat GPT detector supposedly. I don't yeah. know how effective it is, but I think it's gonna be an arms race. Right. Yeah. But there I mean, and there's also I mean, every spam filter is right. some set of algorithms. And, and then, yeah, I mean, the one that I use the most personally is, yeah, if the sender's email does not match the outfit that wants you to update your account info, <laughs> delete it. That's true. Why is it we direct me to a country that they don't do business in? <laughs> so um, I would like to say that deep fakes can be used not only in an firm, if we talk about research. Um, I didn't do that, but I was thinking about using the face for the digital biomarkers, for example, or for analyzing and simulating brain in specific ways. For example, you can emulate some kind of situations which can trigger your emotion and can measure this emotion. I don't know, something that happens in your family, something that happens in your work, and put yourself in this virtual simulation which will look exactly like the realistic one and then measure the outcome of the brain which comes from this. So this technology gives a lot of opportunity to study about our reaction, about how we perceive the world, and how to treat ourselves, and how to understand like how we change after the treatment, for example. But we are not there yet, I'm afraid. This technology is too young to say how actually the brain understands if it's fake or not. Um, we just started doing research using even the virtual reality, like at least putting people in some kind of VR like, uh, uh, environment to see how they would like, respond differently in different situations. But I think we will be there first. Yeah, the, the, the price of electronics is really coming down. And when you mentioned brain reacting to something <coughs> big, I have to ask, uh, and I'll ask everyone, the uncanny valley. Like, could there be ways to figure out what, I, for me, that fascinates me. So for those that don't know what I'm talking about is there's this notion of if something doesn't look like a human, it doesn't bother us, right? Like think of a smiley face, right? Pretty abstract, you know, it's a face, like cartoon characters. But as you get closer and closer to a realistic rendition of a human, um, all of a sudden something happens where it looks weird. And if you want an example, think of any, uh, think of the movie Polar Express, I'm going with a movie thing here. Um, it just something about those characters now look really, really, off-putting. Do you think that, that do you think there might be a way to kind of you know, leverage that type of something's not right for deep fake detection? Honestly, I think so because 
it messes about the new limits of the brain. Right. The brain should eventually learn how to identify where it's fake, where it's real life. Right. We don't have this skill yet because I think we're just not trained enough. We don't have enough like, experience for that. But I believe it might be creepy or crazy, but I really believe that the brain is actually can get there. So we will be able to see, like, huh, this is like something I don't need to react uh, to personally or accept it too close to my heart because this is like just a random phase generated by AI. Again, it will take time. Our brain does not change so fast, but it, it might happen. We need to develop like a mental firewall. <laughs> One thing you start, I think we're starting to touch on is plasticity and brain plasticity. And a lot of this is about what can you train or not. It takes time, but we know the brain learns and makes new neural connections. And then you get into, okay, not can the brain do it alone, but are there ways that you would pair stimulation technologies, which is looked at for medical treatments, but stimulation technologies associated with visualization to supercharge plasticity. Wow. Yeah, even for example, right now, if you try that with VR, first time you put it on, you're like, oh my god, oh my god, it's crazy, and you kind of don't know how to orient, um, you don't understand what's going on, but as soon as more you use it, you kind of get used to it, and you understand, oh, just virtual reality, I'm fine. So it's just about how our brain will adjust, as much as we'll be exposed to this, the better we will identify it, which is fake. Um, just one, one more thought about that. I mean, I'm I'm very much in the camp of, you know, most of the stuff is very much not real, and I like human beings, and AI is not sentient, and so forth, and so on. But I'm also quite prepared to believe that in 100 or 200 years, you know, sort of like beyond what we're doing currently, something could get really, really interesting. And, yeah, at that point, it's like, well, God bless them if they really are sentient or better than we are. Right. We should yeah, politely welcome them to help us be better. But that's a long, long way. So AI sentience is a, is, a, is a several is a topic in its own right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like I think part of part of not the least of which is humans haven't really figured out how we manage to qualify consciousness. Yeah, I mean they, we can't. Yeah. It's like digital. When digital gets sufficiently complex, it becomes right. analog again. Right. And I mean, it goes back to the wonderful movie, which you would know and I don't know, but when the guy's looking down at Earth, he says, it's so weird. They they think with, with meat. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of the name of that movie. Uh, they'll come to me. I see we have a question in the audience. Yeah, so I just wanted to bring you back to uh, <laughs> yeah. back to reality. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to bring you back to uh, actual like content uh, AI detection. Pretty much identifying which content is AI created, which is not in there, the text is coming out now. But there's also like for example, for text for chat GPT, um, you can create a blog posts, for example, and then you can run it through an AI detector, and it will tell you it's AI written, but then you can put it in another AI, um, there's a bot called Quillbot, and it pretty much gives you, uh, like, re rephrases, par paraphrases what you said, so you can run the same AI-generated blog through a paraphraser, and you're going to run it through an AI detector, and it's going to run in as a human uh, written blog. And coming back to, like, the deep base and uh, our brain developing tolerance for, okay, this is not real, as we get more deep fakes and more AI written posts that we tend to not trust. Would there be a time where we are unsure of where which content is real and which one is not, and how do we really separate the two? What does the future look like from your uh, from your angle? Great! Wow, that's arms race and a feedback loop all in one yeah. question. Go ahead. It's I mean it's it's a continuing battle. And I, I see stuff, you must run into this a lot. When, when somebody is plagiarizing content, they will put in synonyms, and it, it sort of reads like Russian propaganda in English. You know, the word for war becomes special operation. And they talk about the economic situation and call it current times. And I mean, you can detect it, but 
if you can detect it, then you can change it, and then you can detect. So it's it's never ending. And then I mean, there are people who write badly, and you would read them and think they're a boss too. Never reverse the test. Another question. Unless you had something to say. Um, you mentioned the professor and the madman. I wonder if there are any other book recommendations. Oh. Book recommendations. Book recommendations. So I'll start with one. It's called The Extended Mind. I'm currently listening to it now. And it's about uh, the notion that um, we think not only our, our, our brain takes in information from inside of the uh, body, so heart rate, that sort of thing, the stuff that we normally ignore, that that can actually lead to some very interesting uh, perception. Thank you for being late. Uh, I cannot remember the author. Thomas Friedman. 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 Very interesting. And where are we today? And what's the evolution of technology? And where is it going? And how does it impact us? And how do we find ways to integrate it in our life in a way that doesn't send the mind spinning out of control? I'm more in the neuroscience space, in that case. Um, so there is a wonderful collection of the books by Cambridge which is neuroscience of learning, neuroscience of um, memory, neuroscience of that, they're just like 10 books. And they're fascinating because they just combine the research of the last 10 years to build it all together, explain how actually our brain works, what kind of needs we have before, they kind of like working with this. And it's written very good for the people who are not in the field. So that's why I usually suggest to people to read about that to understand, oh, that's how our brain works. And they even have one of the neuroscience of suicidal behavior, which is interesting. It is interesting, especially for me, because I'm in depression. I want to understand like, what's actually going on inside my brain, and it's so well written. So you got access to, let's say, all the scientific information, but just put down simple and in clear way. Do you have um, I have a bunch. So Jeff Hawkins, A Thousand Brains, The Biology of Desire by Mark Lewis, which is about addiction. And the end of craving. Who I can't remember the author, but it's it's also that addiction from a slightly different point of view. Uh, the paradox of choice by Barry Schwartz. Daniel Kahneman, thinking fast and slow. And then finally, Johan Hari. H A R I, and I can't remember. It's like chasing the scream or something like that. But it's it's very much. Oh, and actually, the most recent, Tom Ensel, who is head of the National Institutes of Mental Health, and is a neuroscientist, psychiatrist, who's come to the conclusion that I mentioned somewhere earlier, you know, it's, it's really so much of the mental distress in this country is, is due to toxic, it's a response to toxic conditions. Um, yeah, and one more, uh, Randolph Nessie, N as in Nancy E-S-S-E, Good Reasons for Bad Feelings, which is about basically the evolutionary reasons behind, you know, why, why do we feel so bad if evolution is supposed to make us continually better? And there's a lot of really good reasons. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and also you remind me of the book called 100 Year Life. Because we discussed this topic about we this AI will like work instead of us. So this is actually about how our life, learning path, how our career between will be change, like how our planet will change. And it's very interesting. So also recommend. Thank you. It'll be good for the next year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we can have a quiz. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can change. Any other questions from the live studio audience or remote? One question there. You mentioned addiction. In the one second. In the current era with uh, social media and also with AI, as we're consuming content, it's also taking information from us and consuming that to create a better product. There's that loop there. And of course, humans are exploitable from addiction to different heuristics. In the short term, what do you do to combat, or what should we be trying to do to combat that type of use of AI to kind of exploit the human brain against us? So it's interesting. There's a lot of studies in this model of addiction that are basically based on drug use. And I can't remember the name of the book, or I would have mentioned it. But there was a study done in the 70s on um, 
Vietnam War veterans uh, who used cocaine or opium when they were over in Vietnam and came home and never touched it again and never had any problem. And so why is that the case? And what they realized is a lot of addiction is feedback. Patterns, cycles, repeated, which causes an emotional component, which causes use, which repeats on itself over and over, which is linked to geography. So putting you in a different geography changes the paradigm of which breaks the addiction. This relates to tech and in this book, which is getting some distance from your tech can change the way you view your tech, right? A tech-free day, being on the mountains, being in the ocean, like somewhere where you don't bring a device or have access to it will change your paradigm about it. And the longer you go in a geography that is different, and this is why they talk about don't work, where, right, separate your work life on a device and your home life, and how do you regulate your use of a smartphone, is it turns out a lot of us are based on geography. And also, the friends who surround you. I, I, I would add to this very good advice, understand yourself better. I mean, read some of these books, see how they're manipulating you, understand your own, you know, what addiction is, is basically a craving for relief and that makes you do something for that relief. The relief doesn't work. And afterwards, you kind of wish you hadn't done it, which makes you need more relief. And it, it really is repetitive of what you ultimately need is some other purpose that will enable you to leave that behind because you no longer need that short term relief from working on something longer term and more meaningful. People would get addicted, and this was in the biology of desire in particular, they kind of lose the ability to think forward or to think backwards. The, the indigenous natives who had no history were much more liable to addiction than those who had a past and a sort of sense of where they came from and where they were going to and the communities they were part of. And people with addictions tend to be, they, they lose, again, they lose their vision of the world around them and they become fixated on this thing that's supposed to give them relief that never was. And it happens to uh, venture capitalists who are not addicted to profits, but are addicted to exits. Yeah. Oh, one more exit. And, you know, maybe I can say this in this room, that Trump was addicted to more votes. The book about him by his niece was called Too Much and Never Enough. And it's, it's a pattern that presents a lot of kids who were abused as children. And that's, that's one of our bigger social problems right now. But understanding yourself and what triggers you and what gives you meaning and gives you a sense of purpose and the fact that you're needed by other people is, you know, if I were a different person, I'd say, you know, get married and have kids. <laughs> So I would like to add that first of all, we literally know nothing about the addiction coming from the computer, uh, like smartphone and applications at the moment, just because it's very different from the uh, substance addiction. Substance addiction is clear chemical process. We know how to back in here, can see it, what's going on, and to compare the social uh, network addiction or smartphone computer, it's a completely different process. We don't know what is actually happening in our brain and the reaction to all the stimuli. We'll learn eventually, it should happen. But as I can agree with you, this is also really like amazing uh, advices. We do know what is stimuli conditioning, which means if you have specific environment, specific stimuli, light, smell, something, it may trigger your learning or building new patterns, which means your reaction will be uh, repetitive in specific stimuli. So that's why, as you mentioned, during the war, people respond to cocaine different if they are in a completely different environment. So be aware of it. In a different environment, you can need to remove your addiction or some kind of habit. And the uh, same thing about the awareness. Uh, it's also very quite important because if you look at the who are more prone to chemical addiction, it's actually usually people who don't know how to get used to their own emotions how to leave them, how to go through the pain, how to go through the fear, how not feel uncomfortable with the negative emotion specifically. 
And that's that why is a new game. Like, yeah, it's quite important. First, learn about yourself. Learn about what can make you uh, addictive. Learn about other patterns that may be there. For example, in the social networks, um, it's very interesting. If you like something, you will see more content like this. So you need to be aware about this mechanism just to like the content that's completely different. So your life will not become narrow. So can I yeah. both agree and disagree in the sense that there's physical dependency, which is completely different from what you have at the computer. But in addition to the physical dependency, there are the same sort of mental patterns, which is why when when you lost the mental patterns by changing the geography, you could basically deal with the physical dependency because Yeah, I, I mean but we but there is some similarity that we are aware of yeah. that we can use right now, but we don't know exactly what's going on or how to treat that. Like this is for now it's like not very well understood, I guess. It's approximately yeah. what we are now. Now it's like best way just to change the facts, just to remove from this, like learn about this, try to avoid this. Try not to get addicted. And our mental models change a lot. Yeah. Huh. How you understood it maybe 50 years ago. Yeah. It's a bit different than how we understand it now, and probably different in 50 years. Probably see super sentient AI will tell us all about how our brains no, work, just how we make it meet. Go, go find an advertising exec and I'll explain that very nicely. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Uh, do we have any more questions here? One more question here. Can we go over here? No, no more questions. Um, that's a final no. question. I did read in the New York Times that um, um, Java, um, Java, they said that um, that social media has been like in so, like for social media that it um, that it caused brain changes among teens. So my question, so my question is, um, I can send the article um, afterwards. That so my question would be um, in terms of in terms of um, your research, um, is it um, have you guys any um, any um, facts in terms of social media, like they, um, um, breaking changes in in teens or even just adults um, in your research over the years? Does that make sense? I, I would say getting people addicted to their platform is their, is their business model, <laughs> but I won't name anyone because uh, <laughs> I know that's not a good thing to do. But uh, any thoughts on that? It's not an area I study again, but. It's to me, you're, we're talking about plasticity. Again, I mean, it's, it's what, what are you doing to change your a brain pattern? And it seems so where there's weaponized, a weaponized and productized plasticity. Productized. I mean, I don't know that it's weaponized not like teens or you know, putting an idealistic view on it, but this is this. I mean, it's, it's definitely out there. So there is problems with some of the studies. Uh, it's usually very small sample sizes. With a study like a very small population group, it's very rarely more than a hundred subjects, which is not representative at all. Second, there is a lot of other factors: environmental, like school, like people around you, um, the DNA factors, and others, which will affect the way how your brain works. So, to make any, um, I don't know, conclusions right now, we can like, okay, we see that the default mode network works a little bit different than the people who are like smartphone addicted or play like computers five uh, hours a day. It's not the time we can do that. You know, we need to understand that there is a lot of factors that may impact us. Yes, of course, it should impact the brain. For real, like everything that's going on with us impacts our brain. So we, we will see some changes, but we don't know yet, are they bad or good? How they can be like used in the future? But regarding teens and the kids, the problem is, the accelerated plasticity and the brain is still evolving. So of course you would like to avoid teenagers or children specifically to adjust to something that you are not aware of completely, you don't understand how it works. So yeah, with them just preferably to be more careful. Uh, I'll say something snarky. Uh, that was a pretty good business model from the tobacco company. <laughs> 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 yeah. 